We call the United States America, but America really describes two continents, North and South. And the U.S.'s northern neighbor, Canada, often gets short shrift by us Americans. When we do think of Canada, we might think of natural beauty, Niagara Falls, Vancouver, or French Canada. But what's happening in Alberta province is something that, as a Texan, I'm familiar with. Oil. Lots of oil. Over the next half hour, we're going to take a trip to Edmonton, the capital of Alberta province in Canada, and we're going to go beyond oil. We're going to meet the innovators and entrepreneurs of the new Edmonton. We're going to talk to the gatekeeper to Canada's most active entrepreneurship ecosystem, a growth hacker who's quite literally made it to the top of his game, and one of the Edmonton startup scene's rising stars, plus a lot more. I'm Davis Jones. <laughs> yeah. I learn, I create, and I share with as many people as I can. Let's get right to the heart of it, to the heart of what's happening here in Edmonton. There's one question that looms like a storm cloud on the horizon. What's next after oil? We are in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, right? Yep. Canada being one of the most prosperous countries in the world, very clean, very quiet, very, very law and order, etc., etc. The reason we're in Edmonton is something called oil. O-I-L. So oil is the thing. Oil well, is the, the thing. reason to enter here. 1947, oil was discovered near Edmonton. Right? Okay. Before that, it was just a little regional town servicing the agricultural areas. Right? Oil gave us our wealth. Right? We became the Texas of Canada. And it went on, and then we did some marvelous transition, talking about technology, from conventional oil, pulling it out of the ground and all that, to the oil sands, which are not bad, by the way. Okay. He hates to say. It's true, so, they do have kind yeah. of a bad, a bad <laughs> brand or reputation around sure. the world or whatever. Sure, but the oil sands are approximately about 200, 300 miles north of Edmonton. We are the staging area for many, many years. It was one of the largest building sites in the world as the oil sands extraction, the mining processes, the different processes to pull the oil out of the ground and separate it from sand. But now you've written a lot in the local, in, in some of the local media that I've read that you know that there needs to be a shift towards innovation and investment in innovation. Am I getting that right? And there's always the irony of innovation that when there's lots of money around, everyone's going after the low-hanging fruit. Why worry about innovation, Mr. Jones? I think the environmental movement has missed a huge boat, uh -huh. and that is it's not about fossil fuels. It's about emissions. We have learned to lower the emissions from fossil fuels. They're very close to being competitive with solar and with wind. And people don't want to hear this. Mm -hmm. They just feel that fossil fuel is bad, right? right? Well, where we've been technology leaders, where we've been very disruptive, is figuring out how to get those emissions down. If there's one door that people with ideas in this part of the world want to get through, it's getting access to the Tech Venture Angels Incubator. It's the most successful startup support organization in Canada. It's a dream for entrepreneurs and innovators in this part of the world. And if you want to get access to the Tech Venture Angels, you've got to get through Ryan. He's the guy who decides whether an entrepreneur's application gets to the second round or gets rejected. I and Christina Milkey, so there's two of us, do the, all the deal screening for the Angel Investor Group. I'm excited to check this stuff out here with you. So 
show us a little bit about what this is. What are we looking at here with your intake flow log? So this is our very low tech solution to manage all of the leads. So you were telling me that one of your first moves is just to Google the entrepreneur, right? Correct. Because you have had lots of fraudsters or I mean, would you say like a handful? There, yeah, I would say more than 10. More than when 10. When you Google their name and fraud or their name and some, you know, just some variable of a negative term, mm -hmm. you can find a lot of info on it. So that's uh, one of the first things you do when you get these intakes? One of them, yeah. Okay, and then the second thing you do maybe is LinkedIn? LinkedIn would be the second thing. Okay, so I actually organized with you earlier to open up a LinkedIn uh, profile. So this yep. is Brienne, and you said this is not Brienne. No fraud of Brienne. Brienne's a really good, <laughs> correct, a really good company that came top notch. Top notch. <laughs> so if you can show us, what are you seeing? Like, take us back to the time when you were not connected with LinkedIn. This with Brienne on LinkedIn. This is the first time that you've checked out her profile. What are you looking at here? One, do they have a profile? Because okay. we, again, you don't even need a profile for us to say it's a good company, because a lot of entrepreneurs are someone who's doing a trade for 20 years and has an idea and they can fix the process. So I don't necessarily need a LinkedIn profile, but if you have it, it's great. Um, I am going to check clearly your background. I'm so going to go through the experience. Going through the experience. If they have recommendations, it's. I don't even read them to be honest, but it's good to see that they have them. Uh -huh. um, I'm going to see specifically if they've done entrepreneurship before. Oh, you're so, looking for previous previous entrepreneurship. Yeah, so so on this one, Brienne, through no fault of, of her own, this is not a slide on her end, um, she has no previous entrepreneur experience, but clearly she is a physician going through the, the training and seemed to have a medical device that I'm going to assume she identified a problem from her training. So I'm trying to figure out what is the story of, of where they got this idea. Yeah, so you're trying to connect that this person had some background that makes the project relevant. Yeah. The local government and business community in Edmonton believes that entrepreneurship is a big part of building a vibrant economy that doesn't just rely on oil money. And one of the organizations doing the most to support entrepreneurs here is Startup Edmonton. The co-working space and incubator is an awesome space across from the Edmonton Neon Sign Museum, a local landmark. And we went to Startup Edmonton to meet James, the founder of SAM, one of Edmonton's hottest startups. We've actually had so much collaboration yeah. between the different entrepreneurship center, Tech Edmonton, Startup Edmonton. I mean, is this, why did you choose this one? And I mean, is Edmonton just like bustling with awesome places to launch startups or what? So they think there's this sense of community where we're all pitching together. Even if we're working on something differently, we're all rooting for each other. So that sense of collaboration is pretty massive on everything from, you know, sales to marketing to dev to to all aspects. Uh, That's cool. Yeah, it's not just development. It's it's all that stuff. Yeah. Ping pong ball. So we've got TV. We've got an old retro um, arcade here, which I think has, uh, I think, hundreds of preloaded games uh, okay. onto it so we can go through in the console. Uh, so we definitely have a bit of a, uh, a gaming area here. But you as like CEO, do you ever get time to play the games or is oh, it sorry. pretty much no? Uh, yeah, there's a couple of games on here I know well. We bring up Street Fighter once in a while. Um, my outlet is ping pong, so oh, okay. uh, during the lunch break, we uh, bring out the team and, and uh, see who's boss. <laughs> <laughs> Try to. Cool. So. Uh, we're going to check out Sam. You want to yeah. give us a little uh, little demo? Show us a little bit about what yeah, it's all about? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. Well, so we're looking at uh, our, our flagship product, our, our one and only product actually called uh, Sam. <laughs> so it's by definition it flagship. Is, it is the, yes. <laughs> So SAM is essentially, it's a social media CMS, and really our focus CMS is- CMS content management system? Exactly, okay. right. So whereas a traditional CMS like WordPress or other things like that will all be you know, largely focused around uh, maintaining and managing content that you created yourself, okay. we're now taking that same principle and applying it to social media content. So during you know uh, a major event like the Fort McMurray fires or perhaps something like uh, the Brussels attacks or Paris attacks or things like that, massive you know, uh, international stories 
um, we're making it incredibly easy for our users to pinpoint that really relevant social media content coming right from the epicenter of that So how story. will they use it? Is this, I guess, tell us why, what the interaction is between the technology y'all, that y'all are developing, I'm from Texas, so I say y'all, and, uh, and broadcast and how that's changing. Yeah, I mean, because traditionally, I mean, you'd be sending camera crews and spending up helicopters and, you know, deploying a, a massive amount of resources to go cover the story. And while that's happening a little bit, uh, it's less and less so. And there's less need to do that because you have a vantage point of a story like this from thousands of people that are documenting every step of the way. So we're getting real-time photos, videos, information and facts flowing basically uh, into every newsroom that's using our product with a, a tremendous amount of ease. What's the most Canadian thing that you've ever seen happen here? Oh, we have startup street hockey as part of startup week. So on the Wednesday night, we close down the street in front of the warehouse and we have all the different startup companies put in hockey teams and compete against each other. So we had our first one last year and it turned out middle of October to be like 20 degrees out. So everybody was still in shorts and jerseys and it was very competitive. Okay, let's take a break from business for a minute and talk about how to relax here in Edmonton. Edmontonians are a fun-loving people and they love to drink beer. Craft breweries are all over the place, and what goes better with beer than video games? And gaming has a special place here in Edmonton. It's the home of BioWare, one of the most successful game development shops in the world. So I decided to take a break and meet with two gamers who run Edmonton's Classic Video Game Championships to talk about competitive gaming and how crowdfunding is changing gaming. Cool, you guys ready? As ready as we'll ever be. Cheers. 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 Name any game we can figure out a way to make it into a tournament. Our main, our main thing is that we have uh, gamer gauntlets where, where people go head to head, cooperative, in a, in a big tournament format where... Oh, so you have like teams, like, like, well, like they, doubles, they kind of... Uh, there, there would be 20 people enter into the... Uh, Super Nintendo Gauntlet, as we call it, and then the Super Nintendo Gauntlet, and then so they'll be playing games. Some will be high scores. Some will be um, high scores as as a team. Some of them will be one versus one. Just any number of different rule sets that we can throw at them. What what gets the, the most engagement? Like, what do you find of the participants in the audience? Like, like what's one of the big wins, or you know that you? The Super Nintendo Gauntlet for the last one, our last uh, qualifier, was uh, a huge hit. Everybody there had a great time. People were watching it on the big screens. Uh, the people involved were really coming together. They had to work with each other. They had to work against each other. It was just great. People pick up the game and they're like, they think they're the best at it, but they're the best <laughs> in their, you know, on their couch. <laughs> the best on their couch. The I best love on that. their couch. And from what they probably remember, like 10, 20 years ago too. Like some people exactly. still practice and play these games. Well, awesome that we that we did the interview while a jackhammer is going on too. <laughs> Great job with the production team well, here. It is. Mean, you can't talk about Edmonton without the new arena coming up. Right That's away, true. Right? Of all the crowdfunding raises that we know of yet, gaming has been the biggest sector oh, really? so far. Yeah, more money like by far. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering. I mean, like I've never funded a, a game uh, on a crowdfunding platform. Like I don't know. How is that changing it? Why is that cool? What What's special about that? Well, I think it takes the hands out of the. The big, big name developers, your Konami's, your EA's. Crowdfunding's good for games that are more high risk. Oh, because like, it's not like the tried and true, which everyone wants to go for with like the no risk formula. If you're going to put all this money behind it, it better like bring it back. Yeah, you want to have you want to have the title. You can you actually can do like really unique stuff that like can be extremely fun or exactly. like a good flop. But you never know unless you take that risk, right? Yes. All right, dudes. Thanks for talking. Hey, cheers, Davis. Edmonton's 
entrepreneurs who's made it to the top of his game and has nothing to do with oil is Chris Bolivar. Starting out in his garage in the 90s, he launched one of Western Canada's first digital agencies. And today, the free branding agency is a big deal. I wanted to ask him how he built such a successful business and also what lessons he's learned as one of Canada's most successful digital marketers. This company started literally in my parents' basement. Um, I was in university. I was started in, in computer science, actually, and finished in uh, political science. So I think that when you finish with a political science degree, you sort of ask yourself, you know, what you're actually going to do with your life. So I bet. at the time, um, I was involved, actually, in another uh, tech startup company that was sort of a startup before startups were, were cool, let's call it. So. Uh, what's, um, it's really, I think, interesting to see now how much of a culture exists around supporting businesses in that startup environment. And that just, I think that just didn't exist then. It was either you, you know, you, you sink or swim. So we were, we were for, very fortunate with the, the business I had before, um, before the agency, which uh, we built some technology in the, in the kind of financial sector, sold off that technology, um, sold that company off, and then from there I, I had this sort of mix of marketing and branding and design, and that's when I started the company at the time, which became free, which was called Optimedia. So we literally started building websites. It's really interesting to see how we went from the web in its infancy to how people actually see it kind of come together in, in their daily lives now. And I think from my perspective where that really changed was when we had the ability and the, and the, the, the ability to send data wirelessly. So um, I guess getting back to kind of the, the evolution of our business. So we started as a web development firm, um, you know, literally it was back in I think 2002 or 2003 when we got our first office and uh, the the office was, I think, relatively the size of this boardroom right now. And, um, you know, it was really kind of starting with no clients, no staff. So I show up at this office day one of work and, okay, now what do we do? So find some projects to get done, bring on enough projects so that you have uh, more work than you can do on your own, uh, hire on some staff to do that work. Uh, and then from there, we sort of, you know, grew organically in a couple different sort of spurts over the years, brought on a lot of great staff that um, really took the company in a, a lot of a different direction than I probably would have ever done on my own. So I think that a lot of the growth that we've experienced is a product of the people that have come into our company over the years. Um, fast forward to 2008, we acquired a company called Nicarabi Design Group which had a very long history in, in the Edmonton market. Um, so, I mean, how, can you tell me the scale of that acquisition? Was this like millions oh, of no, dollars? Yeah. yeah Thousands? We were, we were, yeah, we were talking like, at that time we were, that time we were, uh, what was it, about eight people, and that pushed us up to about 16 people doing that acquisition. Well, I mean, I guess in terms of acquiring the business, I often wonder this because I think younger entrepreneurs yeah. are thinking, how could I ever acquire a business? Like, is that, how much is that gonna cost me? You know what I mean? Because it's like, that sounds like a pretty daunting task. Well, if that business owner who you're buying it from isn't willing to put uh, a good amount of that purchase price into future payout, then that really should tell you what the actual value of that asset of contracts actually is. Yeah. Well, and that's, I thought that one thing that you said that was interesting when we first started this was this expansion on the psychographic market that you yeah. already have. Yeah. I thought that's really cool because I know in our growth hacking courses we talk about, you know, psychographic targeting and that can sound like kind of a highfalutin marketing term to somebody who's not in marketing and you have made it really practical and said this is going to have a real impact because yeah. once we I'm assuming what you're saying Chris a little bit is once you have the psychographic target for a particular business and you say we know who these people are, then you have information that you can use to expand your offerings to them. Is that? Is well, that... so I'll give you this example here. Um, this is a client that we worked with called The Organic Box. They're a local organic food delivery service in Edmonton. There's a thing I say to clients like where, like you can get to a certain point of sophistication in that marketing program, but there gets to a point like this, I mean, this client I'm showing you here, I mean, the they organic. have, they have, there's, we're, we're in, in their suite of what we do for them, there is probably 
over a thousand different ad groups, right? Like no person can manage that, right? <laughs> totally. So, so I think that there's things that people can do to build success on their own to get them to a point where, um, you know, where they need to actually reach out to somebody who is an expert in it. Like I would say that the, the, one of the things that um, I always try to caution people against is like, well, we can just get somebody in our office to do this themselves. Totally. And what happens? Because social media in, is like the office manager. They Let's run, just have them do they that. Run, they run some ad groups and they just auto bid everything and they see no success. Well, of course they see no success because like there is a lot more of a science to this than just going in and letting, letting it all on. So what's next here in Edmonton? Well, as some of the largest forest fires in the nation's history rage across the tar sands, which are just north of the city, and huge sums of money ebb and flow with the price of crude oil, as do the fortunes of businesses who have set themselves up to cash in on that money at places like one of North America's largest malls, which is on the outskirts of Edmonton, Edmonton's movers and shakers are looking ahead. This place has one of the most supportive entrepreneurship ecosystems that I've ever seen. This is a country with a deep respect for the natural world. We met a group of Edmontonian trail runners, for example, who regularly run vast trails in the huge swaths of preserved lands that surround Edmonton's famous River Valley. And these people are hardcore naturalists fun-loving, smart, and deeply committed to sustainability. If asked to, I'd bet good money that what's next for Edmonton are all good things. Let's just hope that the Oilers' new stadium will magically improve the team's abysmal defense.